Hello, everybody. Good day. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Aparna Mirotra, and I am the director of the UN System Coordination Division with UN Women. Warm welcome. We are pleased that you are here with us. Some of you are working at the country level with the UN, others at the regional or global level, and we are also joined here by focal points of New York-based permanent missions. And because we are doing this virtually, it's a wonderful feeling to welcome people globally for this event and its, it's um, viewership tells me that it's um, one of the best attended events and for that I welcome you warmly and I thank you deeply. So here we are today to talk about something called standards and procedures that pertain to gender theme groups which are in the UN country teams. Now, these are mechanisms to ensure coordinated and coherent UN support to national gender equality priorities. And we're here to launch this so-called document or guidance, which provides um, for the first time ever, clear standards and clear procedures. And today's event is intended to spark discussion on how gender theme groups, which we call GTGs, can be leveraged to maximize UN contributions to the SDGs at the country level. We all know that what doesn't trickle down to the country level has less resonance in many quarters and the impact must be seen at the end of the day at the country level. Now this event today is divided into three segments and I will be moderating the first segment. You will have two separate moderators, one for each segment. The first, segment is a opening segment and is focused on the theme of strengthening strategic engagement on gender equality within the UN system, the role of UNCT gender theme groups. And to address this topic, we have some wonderful speakers, the first of whom is Diane Keita, who is the Deputy Executive Director of UNFPA. She has a long career spanning nearly 30 years of experience with the UN and of which 15 are with UNFPA. And DNA has also held important positions, including that of Minister for Cooperation and African Integration with the Republic of Guinea. Also, DNA served as the co-chair of the Gender Equality Task Team that developed the gender theme group standard and procedures that we are here to launch today. And she will speak to us about leadership for empowered gender theme groups. After her, the other co-chair of this distinguished um, task team, Anita Bhatia will be speaking. And then we will have a third speaker who is the deputy director in DCO. And so the floor is yours, Diane. Now you have four minutes to deliver your inspiring presentation to all of us. Hi, Aparna. I hope I can stay in the, those four minutes. Good day, colleagues, wherever you are. I am pleased to be here with you for this exciting and important launch event. First, I would like to appreciate the collaboration with UN Women in co-chairing the UN DG Task Team on Gender Equality. Both Anita and myself co-chair this task team with the participation of many UN entities. Thank you for that. I would like also to acknowledge the role of UN women in spearheading system-wide coordination on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. Dear colleagues, as the gender task team does not per se exist anymore, having accomplished its role, I encourage each and every of you to support the technical coordinating team. Gender is a major cross-cutting issue in the decade of action to get to 2030. In that respect, accelerating progress on gender equality is a core function of UNCTs. And this is why we are here. And this is why we have the gender team groups. But in order for this to happen, joint leadership for the delivery of results on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls is paramount. It is a must at the country level and regional level to empower gender team groups. Joint leadership is critical. UNFPA has done with UN women in the Pacific, El Salvador, Kenya, or Afghanistan, uh, and so with so many other entities elsewhere. 
that joint leadership. You will hear live experience sharing from my colleagues, Kofi Kwame, UNFP representative in Madagascar. For UNFP, we recognize that there is no gender equality without sexual and reproductive health and right, and no sexual and reproductive health and right without gender equality. We need that joined up partnership and leadership, including at the gender team group level to make this work. As we were developing the guidance, we saw how gender team groups played a critical role in cooperation framework development, in consensus building on national gender equality and women empowerment priority, and in driving cross thematic collaboration. Gender program on gender equality and empowerment of women and girls are reported to be the largest subgroup of all program worldwide. Congratulations. We have gender team group to thank for that. We also have to acknowledge upfront some of the challenges that many gender team groups face in different settings. These challenges can include lack of clarity on purpose and responsibility and limited fund funding. A strong gender team group needs an enabling environment to thrive. This is why robust championing of gender team group by UNCT leadership and grid coherence is needed. When RCs and head of entities exercise their leadership to empower gender team group and provide the enabling or organizational culture that fully support the promotion of gender equality. Moreover, that support the country they work in. It is important to mention that no UN city works in cubicle. They do work hand in hand with the government partners and bilateral partner present in country. This has deep impact on how well gender mainstreaming happens at the country level. UNCT leadership makes sure that there is awareness and understanding of the gender team group mandate by communicating about this internally and externally and by actively visibly consulting on the gender issues. We thank you for that. They need as well a culture where personnel are encouraged to pool and share their knowledge and where gender team foster synergy and collective learning. The RCs and head of agencies and the gender team group chair working together as a collective and transformative leadership team have responsibility to establish and maintain this positive organizational culture. In ending, let me appreciate again the commitment of UNSDG entities who help develop these new standards and procedures so we can foster a new invigorated generation of gender team groups, we hope you will find this resource helpful in your work so we can harness the existing in man's potential of our collective effort and deliver integrated and coherent UN city support to national priorities and UN member states. I thank you. Thank you, DNA. Thank you for conveying some really important messages on leadership and on the need for an enabling environment. We all know that we can have tons of things on paper, but unless we come with the sincerity and a mindset that is authentic and committed, and unless we have standards and procedures that are somehow commonly understood, it'll be difficult to realize the promise of just about anything. So the message on enabling environment and on culture and organizational spirit and method is really key and it's foundational. And if we miss, miss that one, then we will miss a lot more that holds the best of the promise. So at, with that, um, I have the pleasure now of introducing our own UN Women's Deputy Executive Director, Anita Bhatia. Now, Anita Bhatia, most importantly for this event, is, has, is and has been the co-chair of the Gender Equality Task Team with DNA. And in addition, she has brought many new perspectives for, because of her long career with the World Bank Group. And she also has particular interest and passion for partnerships development in which she has a great deal of experience. Anybody who knows Anita will, will hear that passion. Anita will speak to us on the theme of gender theme groups as a vehicle to increase the UN's footprint on gender equality. The floor is yours. Welcome, Anita. Thank you so much, Aparna, for that warm welcome. 
and a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I understand that we have more than a thousand people who have joined, making this perhaps the largest uh, gender theme group meeting ever. And it gives me great pleasure to be able to share a few reflections with you. First of all, I am delighted, I must say, to see my co-chair, Diane. Um, and I would like to start by just saying a very warm thanks to DN for the fantastic collaboration that we had as co-chairs of this group. We shared a joint vision, we shared a common approach, and both of us coming from the country perspective really wanted to make sure that this was something that was meaningful and useful for those of you who are in the front lines uh, implementing every single day. So uh, thank you so much for that, Diane. And with that, let me just say that we are coming together from across the UN system for this event. We have different mandates in the different agencies and the different groups, but it is fantastic that we are all united together by a common dedication to the issue of gender equality. So a very warm welcome to all of you and also to all the representatives of UN member states who have joined us today. I would like to join DNA in first taking this opportunity to thank each and every one of you who actually contributed to the development of the gender theme groups, standards and procedures. This is a collective product. It has only been built because of your dedication, your inputs, your focus and your um, insights. This did not fall from the sky. This has been co-created by all of you. And uh, as DN reminded us, gender equality remains not just central to the achievement of SDG 5, but is really the docking SDG for the achievement of all SDGs. And we, when we think of that, and we think on the other hand of the fact that there's not a single country that we can point to in the world that has actually achieved gender equality, that gives us pause and it makes us understand collectively how very important it is to have standards and procedures so that we can continue to push on this very important agenda. Now, of course, this agenda was important even before the pandemic, but with the onset of the pandemic and the disproportionate negative impacts on women, whether it is on violence against women, whether it is on uh, loss of access to facilities to ensure sexual and reproductive health, whether it is to do with economic security, women have really been badly affected by the pandemic. I don't need to repeat that. We have all seen it and many of us are living it because of the tremendous care burden that women bear, which is much higher than the care burden borne by men. Now, as we seek to come out of the pandemic and to think about recovery and response, it is absolutely essential that gender equality remains central to all response and recovery efforts. And this is not going to happen just by itself. It actually requires focus because governments are busy dealing with the public health implications of the pandemic, Governments are busy dealing with vaccinations. Governments are busy wondering how to build back their shrinking GDP base. So with all of that, it is our job as the UN system to ensure that in whatever public policy is being implemented to deal with the response and the recovery, that gender is a central and important theme. We have seen worldwide, whether you are in a low income country or in a middle income country or even in a high income country, that the pandemic has had tremendous efforts, tremendous impacts on women's, for example, labor force participation. So many women have lost jobs and so many women are dropping out of the workforce worldwide. As a result, not only are we facing the impacts of the pandemic, but we're facing a very real possibility that the condition of women in the next five years is actually going to be much worse, much, much exponentially worse than it was a decade ago. So in order to ensure that we do not lose the gains that have been so hard fought over the last 
decade or more since, or the last 25 years since the Beijing Platform and Declaration for Action, that we do not lose those gains, there will need to be a very intentional focus on gender. Now, the UN development system brings together a range of agencies. All of you are represented here. Our collective work in support of the 2030 agenda is a massive contribution to the world of development. Member states' contributions totaled last year about 38 billion. That means we have the possibility of influencing that 38 billion for gender. But not just that, that funding actually catalyzes other funding. And so we have the possibility of influencing through our actions, not just the actual expenditure of the UN development system on gender, but also the additional investment that that 38 billion actually catalyzes across 110 interagency coordination groups. Um, <clears throat> so the new gender stand, uh, groups standards and procedures that we are launching today is actually the first guidance of its kind. It provides clear benchmarks on how gender theme groups can and should be established and how they should operate to deliver harmonized and coordinated results that actually integrate gender equality. This uh, set of standards and procedures will enable gender theme groups to ensure that the UN across the full breadth of its work at the country level will effectively address gender equality and women's rights issues and concerns of the sorts that I outlined. It will drive more financing for gender equality. It will increase the footprint of the UN on gender issues across sectors, and it will enhance our influence and our coordination capacity with other actors at the national, regional, and global level. It will be a powerful tool for helping to implement the common agenda and thereby it will strengthen the networks of the cross-sectoral partnerships with host governments, with women's networks, with women's groups, with women's organizations, with international financial institutions, and all other development actors. In closing, I want to just express very sincerely UN Women's full commitment and support to implementation of the new guidance in collaboration with all of you. I hope that you will find that this launch event is useful. And more importantly, I do hope that you will find the actual set of standards and procedures to be a very practical tool that you can use in your day-to-day -day work to push gender equality. It will be an important driver for acceleration of SDG 5, and also all other SDGs. Thank you so much, and back to you, Aparna. Thank you, Anita. And if we haven't heard the passion for partnerships and for expanding influence, then I think we need to have our ears checked. I thank you deeply for having pre presented a very panoramic perspective on this matter and to underpin the message that we can't succeed on this alone nothing there is no success that is lonely so to speak you we have everything that we do in our life no matter what and especially when you're talking about development work is necessarily collective uh, a, 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 done collectively and for that we need solidarity and for that we need partnerships built on trust and goodwill and understanding and it is on this understanding that that i think the the foundation of the standards and procedures lie. Because again, a common understanding is what it provides. The guidance was developed commonly and hopefully it will be implemented commonly and hopefully the impact will be huge and common. And I think that is the message that we heard from Anitas in a very lovely and articulate way about expanding our footprint um, in order to service the cause of gender equality. So with that, we will now turn to Rosemary Kalapurakal, who joins us from DCO, which is the office that coordinates the system. Where is she? Where she is the deputy director. 
Now, she has more than 20 years of experience from the UN system and focus particularly on sustainable development and inclusion. And we will hear from her on the topic of delivering integrated support, the role of gender theme groups, perhaps from an operational point of view. And I'd just like to say that for many people who are interested in the detail of the standards and procedures, we will be bringing some of that to you later on today in this event. So Rosemary, the floor is now yours. Welcome. Thank you, Aparna. Um, hello, colleagues. Good day, good morning, good afternoon. And it's such a pleasure to join the co-chairs of the Gender Network. Uh, and I really appreciate the invitation to join the party because it is a celebration with uh, people who I know to be champions of gender equality and women's empowerment. Always a nice uh, way to start the day. Actually, for me, it's evening, but even so, it's a good boost in the arm. I want to echo what you said, Aparna, that, uh, that seeing the range of entities and participants today, including our resident coordinators, uh, entity representatives from headquarters and country offices, and I hear even member states, that's fantastic. Um, why am I here? Because as we enter the third year of implementation of the UN reform, it's clear that the challenge to deliver more coherent and better integrated support is more relevant than ever, sadly to confront the complex threats the world is facing. We've heard it from Anita, we've heard it from DNA. This issue of inequalities continues to whittle away at the potential for, uh, prospect, uh, for progress and the importance of gender equality is primary among these. As the SG has outlined in his common or our common agenda, these major threats cannot be confronted without equally major changes in the way we and country level coordination, coherence, impact, as you said, Aparna, to confront these inequalities, specifically on gender equality and women's empowerment is more urgent than ever. And therefore, um, the, the, uh, the launch of these uh, standards is really critical. DNA pointed out that this is a core function of UN country teams and the leadership of the resident coordinators is going to be paramount and I'm therefore very happy to be associated with this set of standards and procedures that is based on evidence gathered on what has worked at the country level to ensure that gender equality and empowerment of women and girls features centrally in our joint and joined up programming work. It's therefore fitting that much of the emphasis of the new gender theme groups is on the cooperation framework, the new uh, generation of UN country team programming that is now the central guiding planning and implementation uh, instrument at the country level that presents the full integrated support package of the UN to the development challenges that are identified in a common country analysis. But I just want to emphasize what other speakers have mentioned, the preparation of the standards and procedures is the beginning not the end, because they're only as good as how effectively they are implemented. The advice the gender theme groups provide through the engagement process in the development of the cooperation framework will be key to ensure the alignment of, of gender equality issues across the outcomes of the cooperation framework. Uh, DCO commits to working with resident coordinators, and I see a few online today, to ensure that this works and that through their leadership, they act to strengthen the country level coordination and champion the role of gender theme groups. I'm pleased that in our reporting to ECOSOC, we have seen that resident coordinators have served to amplify uh, these key issues and mandates uh, very effectively to date. And this is going to be a key priority going forward. The role of RCs as champions for gender equality are rec is recognized in these new standards and procedures. And especially in the context of the uh, CCN cooperation framework, given the enormous challenges we face today. There's so much RCs can do and have done to ensure that these inputs to joint analysis and planning are systematically sought from gender theme groups. And here I would like to acknowledge the role played, for instance, by gender theme groups in countries with great impacts on CCAs, such as Botswana, Myanmar, Bosnia, Tunisia, many more, as well as ensuring that cooperation frameworks have a strong gender lens, uh, for example, Cote d'Ivoire, Morocco, etc. 
we know we have proof of concept and we need to make sure that this is scaled up much more systematically. So in closing, thank you very much for this opportunity, Aparna and colleagues to join you to celebrate this accomplishment. And let's see this as a foundation so that it doesn't become just one more set of guidance that's disregarded, but actually becomes a very solid foundation as we proceed to uh, program and deliver far more effectively than um, given the challenges we have ahead. Back to you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I can't, I don't know from where you stopped hearing me. So I just want to thank you, Rosemary. And I want to say one thing about your message, which is, you know, priorly, whatever work we did on standards, um, and of course, the GTG standards and procedures is the first time that we're doing this. But in whatever smaller experience we've had in this area, we've not really had an office um, in the past. DCO is a new creation, and it is, um, you know, it, 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 it in a way monitors and propels and catalyzes joint work. And the fact of its monitoring assists us. And so it's really a very good moment and your participation is truly you know, meaningful because that is what we, you know, is novel and that is what is required for us to do better than we did before. So it's not only that the guidance is produced, but rather, as you said, it has to be operationalized. And for that, having coordination hubs, we and UN Women have a coordination mandate, but there's more to coordination. You need many people, you need many centralized systems that monitor this and, and reflect the data centrally. And that's where you know DCO and yourself have been very helpful. So thank you for that. Um, and time is short, and therefore I will very quickly hand over to my wonderful and esteemed colleague Raquel Lagunas, who is the director for UNDP's gender team and has many things to tell you. And she will be moderating the next segment. Um, I'm sure you will enjoy the next segment as much as we have enjoyed this. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, DNA. Thank you, Rosemary. And the floor is yours, Raquel. And goodbye to all of you from me. Thank you so much, Aparna. Um, it is really a pleasure to be here today with many, many friends. So I think if we have learned something listening to our panelists is that if, um, we grow, we learn, we improve our work and we increase the impact when we go together, right? So this segment uh, will focus on the introduction of the standards and the procedures. And before, I really wanted to acknowledge and name uh, the components of the working group on gender thin groups. So we know who they are and it's very important uh, to, uh, to give this space. Uh, we have 10 uh, UN entities. I will start by the CEB secretariat DESA, ESQUA, ILO, IO, IOM, ITC, OCHA, OHCHR, PBSO, DPPA, DP, DPPA uh, RACs, uh, New York Office, UNDCO, UNDP, UNEP, UFPA, UNHCR, UNICEF, and of course, UN Women and the World Food Program. Uh, so I wanted to acknowledge also the colleagues and the active participation from the field, from regional hubs, from countries uh, who have contributed to the uh, development of these uh, standards and procedures. And before moving ahead with what it matters, right? That is the presentation. I'm sure you are at this point very curious and, and willing to listen to our colleagues. Please don't forget to use the Q and A uh, function to address questions that you may have. So. I wanted to welcome, first of all, Silha Rahander from UN Women and Rejasi Yah from UNICEF. They are co-chairs of the technical level of the working group. And we will have, first of all, Silha presenting chapter one. So over to you. 
Thank you so much, Raquel, and thank you, friends, uh, for joining us today. The Gender Theme Group Standards and Procedures we're launching today uh, updates the 2018 Resource Guide for Gender Theme Groups with clear directive on how gender theme groups should be set up and how they should operate, as both Diane and Anita highlighted. For gender theme groups to operate effectively, it was felt important to align the guidance on gender theme groups with UN reform the new resident coordinator system, uh, the cooperation framework, and revised management and accountability procedures. The purpose of the update was also to reflect the mandates and provisions of the 2020 QCPR resolution, including to accelerate progress on gender equality, ensure a gender sensitive uh, recovery from the COVID pandemic, and enhance coordination across humanitarian development and peace-related interventions. What is new is a cascade of accountability for gender mainstreaming put forward in the standards and procedures through clear expectations on the roles and responsibilities of resident coordinators, heads of agencies, gender theme group chairs, and members. Also new is the very visible way in which gender theme groups are positioned as a critical instrument for within the UNCT, as a source of advice for the UN country team and an entry point for partnership development and for the host government and gender equality organizations to discuss their support needs, among other. A strong focus on results also underpins the new guidance. Gender theme groups should support the achievement of results directly relevant to the UNCT work plan. For example, a fully gender responsive common country analysis and cooperation framework. The standards and procedures addresses the issue of empowering gender theme groups from five perspectives. One, the mandates for gender theme groups set by intergovernmental resolutions, key being the 2020 QCPR, as well as standards agreed on by the UN system in the UNCT swap gender equality scorecard. Two, guidance on what the composition of gender theme groups should be and how gender theme groups should be set up as part of the UN's architecture at the country level. For example, ensuring representation of each UN agency that has signed the cooperation, cooperation framework and of each result group. Three, ensuring gender theme groups uh, leadership is at the head of agency level, ensuring, among other, representational authority and a direct, direct link with and reporting line to the UNCT. Four, ensuring uh, clear roles and responsibilities as mentioned for resident coordinators, heads of agency, gender theme group chairs and members, and this in line with the management and accountability framework, for example. Five, identifying how to ensure and strengthen accountability as part of performance management and through reporting, tasking the UNCT to tackle any issues that may have interfered with gender theme group performance. And with this, I hand over to Shreyasi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celia, and thank you, Raquel, and hello, everyone. Let's now turn to the, to the second and the third section of the standards and procedures, where we talk about the main functions of the GTG and how they should operate. So broadly speaking, the main function of the GTG is can be classified into two categories, the program support function and the integrated policy dialogue, advocacy and technical support functions that they provide. These functions cover all UNCT processes, supporting communications, advocacy, partnership for national gender equality priorities. So within the program support function, uh, the updated guidance envision an expanded role of the GTGs in light of the strong coordinated approach to the SDCF uh, you know, that is required uh, uh, to be performed within the UNCTs. So the GTGs would now provide advice and support to the identification, prioritization, and achievement of the cooperation framework, gender equality results, and related processes, as well as integrating a gender transformative approach throughout the cooperation uh, framework roadmap, the framework design, contributing to the funding um, uh, funding framework to ensure the gender equality results are fully costed, as well as supporting the implementation and monitoring and evaluation. For instance, 
instance, has recommended that GTG should review the annual uh, reports of the results group and provide feedback to ensure that progress on gender equality results across the cooperation framework is reported. Similarly, GTGs uh, uh, would prepare an annual report on the implementation of the GTG work plans, uh, as well as support the UNCT to keep track of the achievement by the UNCTs of the gender mainstreaming standards and spearhead the UNCT swap assessments. Uh, moving on to the next function, which is the integrated policy dialogue and advice and technical support function, the GTGs uh, should advance strategic dialogue and informal uh, consultations on gender related policy questions with the government and civil society, ensuring an integrated approach to the aspiration of the host government to reach SDG 5 and gender equality targets across the SDGs. Uh, what does this mean in practical terms? It basically it entails strategic dialogues and consultations with women's, uh, with women's machineries with uh, uh, and women's empowerment policy questions with the governments as well as with the civil society um, and, and providing coordinated technical support and gender issues, UNCTs, they should support uh, collective sector specific policy dialogues as well as advice on national gender equality priorities. Uh, including the SD, uh, SDGs uh, uh, voluntary national reviews. The final section of the standards and procedures, uh, you know, talks about the operational mod modalities, specifically um, what resources, skills, uh, support, and the enabling environment that G GTGs need for empowered decision making on gender equality priorities. So, uh, moving on, in terms of capacity. Uh, a robust gender architecture of UN entities is a prerequisite for a strong gender theme group. So if the gender focal points and, and gender specialists of entities are empowered and at the relevant seniority level and actively championed by the heads of agencies, then this will enable the entity to participate effectively in the gender theme group, contributing to the collective goals as well as to the internal gender mainstreaming. The resident coordinator holds the heads of agencies accountable for establishing effective internal gender architecture and adequate representation. In terms of the enabling environment, a supporting and enabling environment uh, uh, entails regular, active, visible, internal and external communication with and about GTGs. The standard and procedures document provides a lot of helpful guidance on, on what are the effect, uh, efficient working uh, methods for gender theme groups around work plans, regular meeting, extended meeting with the UNCTs to coordinate uh, with the humanitarian and peace building effort, as well as the annual UNCT UN swaps and external meetings. The financial resources uh, we know are, are critically important. Uh, adequate resources enable uh, a functional and empowered G GTG, and this is mandatory. It is called by the ECOSOC resolution. Um, and the guidance uh, that, you know, the standards and procedures guidance provides several options, including earmarked funds, separate budget lines, um, uh, such as adding a budget line to the cooperation framework, fund, uh, funding framework to accommodate cross thematic support to the cooperation framework design with the percentage earmarked for the GTGs. And finally, uh, the regional support. Uh, there are several regional UN coordination mechanisms available to support country level GTGs, including regional uh, peer groups and regional gender equality issue based coalition and, and regional GTGs, depending on different regions. So uh, with that, uh, we come to the end of what are the different sections of the standards and procedures uh, guidance. Over to you, Raquel. Thank you so much, Rayasi. Thank you, Silja. I see very interesting questions in the chat. We have time, I guess, for at least a couple of a couple of questions. And I'm going to select the most kind of, I don't know if controversial, but challenging one. So um, I wanted to go first to, um, to Sil Silja. So we have one question, uh, thanking for the new guidance, but congratulating all of, uh, all of you so the question is, how can we address the existing siloed approach of agencies through this guidance, especially since this is very much at the core of the attitude, it's a matter of the behavior, it's more uh, of some UNCT, no? it's more at the individual level. Uh, uh, so that uh, what, what or how do you think these documents, these guidelines, these standards are, are going to help to break the silos? The, over to Silje. 
Thank you so much. This is a really, really important question I have to uh, recognize. Um, the gender theme group is intended indeed, as uh, Anita highlighted also in her remarks, to really provide that vehicle for a cross-sectoral footprint of the UN. And, you know, it is very much around ensuring um, membership um, of the gender theme group reflects every agency around uh, that is signatory um, to the cooperation framework and setting in place um, accountability mechanisms. Um, so defining first, what is the key role that um, you know, the, the different counterparts have to play? Um, what are they accountable for and setting really clear expectations uh, for this? Um, it is also about work in practice as Apana highlighted really, um, sort of working out together what is a coordinated approach so that the gender theme group can play that function as an entry point for the government and civil society um, on, on gender equality for, for technical support and for sort of partnership um, development. Um, it's not an easy task, we know that, but you know, this is very much um, underpins um, you know, the whole sort of UNCT configuration process and the approach to the cooperation framework of thinking about aligned and integrated approach. And this is indeed something that the standards and procedures aims to address in very practical ways through the kinds of working methods that are framed there and, and um, to emphasize the, the cascade of accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Silja. And there is a recommendation from this person who asked this question to include this component in the launching of the guidelines. So thank you for the recommendation. The second question goes to Sreyasi, and it's also a very challenging one, too. And it's about uh, uh, this, this uh, colleague is raising the fact that it's not the lack of guidance or the tools, right, even though this is a very welcome a, a new 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 document is the lack of accountability sometimes commitment from the rest of, of of agencies so how we can address this other dimension that is more more again more not the, the non-tangible part of the culture of this kind of ground right uh, but so fundamental to define uh, the work and, and the agenda no or gender equality agenda if it's at the big, at the first at the top or is at the bottom of the work of, of UNCTs. So Sreyasi, in your experience also, and um, um, based on the on the all the thinking that the group have been doing and putting in this document, how do you think this this uh, new new framework can help to to strengthen the accountability, but also the commitment? And the commitment is more at an individual level. So uh, over to you, Sreyasi. Thank you so much, Raquel, and thank you so much, colleague, for that question. I mean, I think you sort of hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, the, the guidance and the procedures only going as far as saying what should be the case, right? But what actually happens depends so much on the individuals and the, uh, in this case, um, I, I think one one thing that we all know from our experience, uh, as well as what we heard from the, uh, you know, from 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 the mapping that we did in terms of the challenges. Remember, these standards and procedures were actually developed in response to an analysis that was conducted based on quite an extensive review of what we found from country offices uh, and and UNCTs about where are the gaps in the current um, functioning of GTGs. And 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 I think this is exactly what we found. Um, you know, accountability was 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 really missing and what really uh, you know and one of the points that 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 the that the guidance talks about is that the 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 gtg and the functioning and the efficient functioning of gtgs and the results that the 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 collective um, work of the gender theme group can can deliver are is only as strong as uh, the mandate of gender equality within entities so the stronger the entities own gender architecture and accountability on, on gender equality, the, the, the better we will be as, as a collective. So we need to be focusing both on the individual as well as on the collective. Uh, and when we were developing the guidance, one of the things that we felt was that, and the reason to link it, of course, with the uh, with, with, with the overall uh, uh, new UN, uh, UN system is to focus on the role on the leadership of the RCs. 
So the accountability that the RCs have, the accountability that the heads of agencies have in creating that mandate and creating that space for gender theme groups is critically important in their functioning. Um, and, and making sure that the people who are participating in the GTGs are actually the ones who have the technical expertise of working on gender equality within their entities and, and are, are, are truly committed to working on a coordinated approach uh, to gender equality within the UN system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reyasi. Very comprehensive and useful answer. I see the question of how can we find the guidance and, and the, the, the standards, and you have the document in two places, in the UN Women website, but also uh, in the UNDCO website, so you can download it from, from there. Um, I'm not sure how are we doing in terms of time. We have many good questions and comments, but I guess we'll close here to open for the next segment, saying that in my experience, any guidance note, any document can be implemented mechanically, right? And in fact, we need to depart from this understanding of gender mainstreaming as a mechanical, a mechanical work rather than that. And it's very welcome one comment from the QA. We need to implement this document or implement the, the, the standards using new, new methodologies and using different approaches like the behavioral change approach. Um, and as Sarah Yassi said, keep in mind that this time the emphasis is on leadership. So leadership of RCs, leadership of RR. So I'm very happy to share with you that one of the next uh, invitees is an RR, is a male and is a co-chair. So we need to look for this kind of revolution. So I will handle now over my, my dear colleague uh, from UNICEF, Laurel that she will be the facilitator of the next, uh, the director of the gender team of UNICEF. She will be the facilitator of the next um, uh, slot in the agenda. And thank you for, so much for listening and for the good presenters we have had. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Raquel. What a pleasure it is to be here for this exciting conversation. And indeed, we are moving now from hearing about what the standards are and why they're important from our first two sessions, and now diving deep into what they look like in practice. My name is Lauren Rumble, and I'm the Director of Gender Equality here at UNICEF. Um, and just really, really a privilege to join the stage with so many fantastic esteemed colleagues. So the three we're gonna be hearing from today is Ulrike, Richardson, who is the development coordinator for the UN Kosovo team, and she's going to be talking about gender in the cooperation framework, which we've heard referenced a few times in the guidance. And then we'll hear from Ziad Sheikh, who's the UN Women Representative in Jordan, and also the chair of the gender theme group there. And finally, from Jose Vicente Troya Rodriguez, who's the resident representative for UNDP in Costa Rica, and also the gender theme group chair. So really, really looking forward to hearing how we live those commitments. Let me just see if we can see Ulrika and Ziad on camera. There you are, wonderful to see you. I'm gonna start with you, Ulrika. And the question I'm posing to all of you is essentially um, from your experience, what can we expect from a gender theme group in country? One that's working well. Over to you, Ulrika. Uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, and it's really a pleasure. Um, I am um, the UN resident coordinator. We call it development coordinator here in Kosovo for various reasons. Uh, but yes, uh, so uh, basically for me, uh, and this is the second time I'm the resident coordinator, I have always used the gender theme group as one of my absolute uh, best um, allies, but also best tool to ensure that everything that we do as a UN system uh, is is actually is sensitive to gender equality dimensions and to women's rights dimensions, and so for me it's 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 un uh, it's an un what can I say it's really a unique and, and essential tool for that uh, both uh, that type of having a platform where you gather all agencies where you really can um, can make sure that you have an integrated approach to whatever, let's say, entry point in your program, whether that is on local development or whether it's on, on green transformation or economic uh, empowerment, uh, that you have that essential uh, gender dimension. And because we said, and it was said initially, 
there is nothing that we do that does not have a gender dimension. So if you don't have that essential platform, you would be spending your time trying to gather and, and hone in everyone in terms of being coordinated and coherent. So I find that very important. I also find it important to benefit from human women's um, uh, coordination mandate, actually, because I think that if we combine that with our coordination mandate, we become much more strong. Uh, I've had also excellent experience with other UN agencies chairing uh, gender theme groups in the past. So um, I think that's essential. Um, very, very important also in terms of the partnership. Uh, you know, if, if we all, we were 15 agencies on the ground, if we all would go and, and speak to the gender uh, machinery, whether that is a equality agency or whether it's, a, let's say, a women caucus in the parliament, we would be basically um, uh, also not, not being very coherent, we risk losing efficiency and effectiveness, and we also obviously risk losing those integration points. So I see it internally essential for, uh, for ensuring accountability and results on gender equality um, and coherence, obviously, but also externally for being more effective. And we saw it in Kosovo here, the advocacy of the gender theme group actually not only uh, contributed to uh, Kosovo uh, ratifying the Istanbul Convention, uh, now also having a new strategy on gender-based violence, and also thirdly, um, uh, having a, in the criminal code, gender-based violence as a criminal offense as opposed to a civil offense. So that just goes to show uh, the whole of a sort of system, the UN's uh, collective power that we have when we come together around one, uh, one topic that is essential to all of our mandates. Now, what we, why was it important for our co cooperation framework? When you had a GTD, it was well-functioning. It was a very good uh, collegiality in the group, uh, information exchange, but also that more strategic policy uh, work. It was much easier for us to obviously advocate and have the data available and the reasons available to, uh, to actually advocate for having a separate outcome in our uh, CF on uh, cooperation framework on gender equality, which is what we have today. Uh, we signed off our CF uh, last year, and we have that now gender equality as, as a separate priority in our uh, CF. It was also, of course, much facilitated by the GTG to, um, to ensure the gender dimension of uh, the CCA. Obviously that was a precursor and let's say, uh, it's, it's the ana analytical tool that we developed before we do the CEF. But so what we have right now in, in Kosovo is that we have a combined GTG with the result group. We are too few, uh, we would be sort of <laughs> making us too scarce of having uh, two, one GTG and one result group on gender, but now we have a combined one. I, I really welcome the guidance put forward in the, in the new guidelines on how you can make that work. The challenges, uh, what we need to look out for, but also how we can, uh, how we can make it work uh, in favor of gender equality and women's, uh, women's rights and women's empowerment. One thing I want to say before, before, um, uh, before finishing is, one of the things that I felt was very important with having a gender theme group and having the UN system here uh, organized in such a way that you can quickly call upon them uh, in a collective manner, that you have data available, that you have a, a sense of uh, collectivity available. When we faced COVID, we were in the midst of a crisis or at the onset of a crisis, you can't set up these mechanisms, nor can you set up the partnerships from scratch with the gender machinery. So having that in place allowed us to quickly if not say immediately, put gender at the heart of our socioeconomic response plan to COVID, uh, including uh, the socioeconomic impact assessments. So we did that and our, uh, in fact, we were able to uh, advocate with the government, uh, convince the government that their recovery package had women at the center and gender equality as one of the key uh, priorities. So um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Thank you, <laughs> but you will that was perfect. Keep control on me. That was so, perfect. Uh, yeah. Tell me, yeah. I, I think I've finished that, but I'm, uh, I would be uh, willing to, um, to take questions, obviously. Over from my side.
Yes, thank you so much, Ulrike, and please do stay for questions. We're going to open up for a really lively conversation um, as soon as we're done with our panelists. And really, what I've taken away from your um, intervention this morning or evening or afternoon, wherever you are in the world, is to um, hear the importance of um, reflecting gender in the common country analysis, which in turn led to the prioritization of a gender equalities in your um, cooperation framework. Congratulations, that's a huge milestone. Um, and now um, also you touched on having a coordination mechanism in place before disaster strikes so that you can quickly turn upon that. And we'll be hearing more about that from our um, third panelist actually, who's going to be Kofi Kwame, the UNFPA representative in Madagascar. Kofi, I wonder if you could join us. Um, and now I'm gonna turn to you, Ziad. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to hear from you in your experience, what a gender three group should be doing and what that can look like. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, very much uh, welcome this, uh, this opportunity. Um, I think what it can look like and what we can expect with the right support and commitment, of course, is uh, the ability to build up cross-sectoral support and response. And for me, this means equipping and positioning the GTG to play a key coordination role, not only within the UN, but also with government, civil society, donors. Because with coordination and coherence across these stakeholders and others, then I think real change is possible. So what does that kind of success depend on? Well, very much in line with the GTG standards and procedures, uh, I'll highlight three points. Firstly, collective UN ownership and commitment at the RC and UNCT label. But I think important to highlight here is that while there are accountability frameworks in place to promote this, it cannot be taken for a given. The UN in Jordan, for example, was without a GTG for quite some time. A related issue is how the UNCT back then felt it was benefited from the GTG. Was it getting a return on its investment? Was the work of the GTG being reflected at the strategic level and in key planning processes such as the CCA and the cooperation framework? And then, of course, is the issue, how was the GTG being invested in and supported? And so my second point. To succeed, you need strong, joined up gender expertise and capacities with identified and well-planned opportunities for leveraging this expertise. Opportunities to demonstrate that the return on investment can be good. Here in Jordan, and through establishing subgroups in anticipation of what lies ahead, the GTG is playing key formal roles in shaping the results framework of the next cooperation framework. And this builds on the GTG's significant contributions to the CCA, regarded as very strong when it comes to gender. We also have in place a subgroup to support the and inform the implementation of the CF, which will begin next year, working closely with the senior program group. And also the GTG played a key role in the socioeconomic framework for the COVID-19 response. Uh, initial findings from the Jordan pilot of the system-wide evaluation show that the GTG, along with other interagency groups, contributed significantly to a more collaborative approach during the emergency phase, an approach we now have as the UNCT to take forward uh, to the cooperation framework. And then thirdly and finally, how can we leverage this kind of GTG to foster and support cross-sectoral partnerships? Well, the gender coordination mechanisms across government, civil society, and the donor community are well established and functioning effectively in Jordan, all with some type of support and engagement from UN Women and the UN. The GTG, for example, is bringing its expertise to these partnerships, currently supporting the government's VNR process to ensure gender is mainstreamed throughout. It also facilitated and supported women's civil society participation in the development of the CF. And then drawing from my experience in Nepal, if, my, if I may, prior to the 2015 earthquakes, uh, there was a well-established, well-functioning GTG in place with strong commitment and support from the URC and UNCT. And this very much speaks to Ulrika's point, because then post-earthquake and with surge support, 
the GTG was able to quickly pivot to become the broader intercluster gender working group, which, for example, supported the government in developing its post-disaster needs assessment and recovery framework and worked with women's civil society to support their advocacy and position in, in the response. But the point I'd like to echo here to close is that arguably the natural disaster, the earthquake, like the COVID-19 emergency, helped to focus minds and adopt a more coordinated and collaborative approach. Thank you so much, Ziad, for that powerful presentation and of your three points, um, yet again reiterating the importance of a group to collaborate across sectors and pre-position um, the UN to really advance uh, critical issues for gender equality. Thank you, Ziad. Let me just check if Kofi's online. Kofi, if you're online, we'd love to see you on camera and hear about your experiences in Madagascar. Um, so over to you, what do you think a successful gender um, theme group looks like and what can we expect from it? Uh, thank you. Uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm supposed to talk about uh, uh, advancing work on gender issues across uh, the humanitarian and development uh, nexus through the GTG. Uh, here I am in Madagascar, and all of you know uh, what is happening in Madagascar, uh, dealing with uh, humanitarian uh, issues in, the, in southern Madagascar, uh, at the same time operating also in uh, the development uh, setting. Uh, I think that the GTG here in Madagascar uh, is playing a, a critical role, uh, ensuring that uh, gender and uh, uh, human rights and women's rights, you know, are uh, integrated in all what uh, we do uh, in Madagascar. So uh, the GTG uh, is co-leading two strategic uh, uh, gender coordination mechanisms in Madagascar. First, we have the uh, gender group led by the government through the Ministry of uh, Population, uh, where we as UNFPA, we serve uh, uh, as the secretariat. And um, so that group uh, led by the ministry uh, is uh, trying to enhance consultation and exchange between uh, national authorities, civil society organization, development partners on gender equality and uh, women's rights issues. Uh, every quarter we have a meeting uh, to uh, work on, uh, discuss and agree on uh, how to move forward. Then we have the uh, gender and uh, human rights uh, thematic group that is uh, co-chaired by uh, uh, UNFPA and uh, the Office of the Human Rights. Currently, uh, the Officer of the Human Rights is taking the lead uh, for, from this year. And uh, we will see that uh, this uh, group has the objective to mainstream gender into all UN support programs uh, in the country in line with the, the cooperation framework. And you can see that across the four pillars of the cooperation framework from governance, uh, rule of law, uh, to uh, human capital development, to productivity and decent work, and to sustain resilient and inclusive environment management, uh, gender and human rights issues cutting across. And here in this group, uh, we meet every month but you will see that so far, uh, among all agencies, we don't have yet uh, UN women uh, in Madagascar. So just to highlight a few uh, key achievements and then let you know also how we think that uh, the GTG can work better in the new, uh, within the revised uh, uh, document. Uh, in terms of uh, a legal framework, I think the GTG worked hard with the government for the adoption of the GBV law in 2019. And so far, uh, we have been able to finalize the, uh, what we call the decree, the application decree that uh, we expect that uh, uh, it will be signed so that implementation starts. Then we have also the support to the government uh, in the development of the universal periodic review where uh, about uh, uh, 203 recommendations were received by Madagascar 
out of which uh, 174 were accepted. And the uh, GTG worked also with the government to uh, come up with uh, uh, the implementation plan. We also have, uh, uh, we also supported, I mean, the GTG supported the development of the socioeconomic response plan uh, to COVID. And I think uh, one of the panelists also talked about this, and this is critical, ensuring that uh, uh, we have the integration of gender dimensions within the socioeconomic response plan. In terms of the activation of uh, the, the GBV and protection cluster, uh, this is something also that uh, we are working on, uh, ensuring that uh, there is an activation of uh, that GBV uh, sub, sub cluster. And uh, one of the important thing that the GTG also have to uh, support was the establishment of an African Women Leaders Network in Madagascar. And this is interesting because it includes uh, all leaders, women leaders in Madagascar, led by the president of the National Assembly uh, and uh, in collaboration with the First Lady, uh, the African Union, the, uh, the UN, and uh, women's organizations. And uh, recently, that platform you know, came up with uh, a consultation forum where they reflected on the economic recovery of women in the context of COVID and drought and uh, support the empowerment of Malagasy women and ensuring they enjoy their uh, human rights. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Kofi. We, yes. We also, uh, in terms of capacity development, I think this is also an area where the GTG is effective to ensure that uh, the capacity of all actors, you know, being in humanitarian or development setting, capacity, uh, capacities are built so that we can easily integrate uh, gender and uh, including PSC. The PSC, it's very important. We also work on that under the leadership of the RC to ensure that we address those issues when they, they come. Now, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Kofi, I have to interrupt you there. Could we uh, just wrap, wrap up in the next five seconds or so, so we can make sure okay. we have time for all the panelists. Thanks so right. much. To wrap up, I would just say that uh, uh, for what, how we see uh, the GTG effective or efficient in the application of, of, uh, of the new uh, document, we think that we need to strengthen the understanding of the, of the collective accountability which would enable head of agencies and the focal points in the GTG to be flexible and devote some time for effective participation and contribution, being technical, financial. Uh, and then uh, we also think that somebody said it, that the flag, the UN flag should be the one promoted when it comes to uh, uh, the implementation of joint actions uh, and also that uh, in terms of resource mobilization, as part of uh, the resource mobilization strategy for the cooperation framework that the RC leads the whole uh, head team, including the head of agencies to ensure that we uh, mobilize resources and allocate resources for uh, the GTG to address issues related to uh, gender, uh, to gender. Now, another important uh, thing is the visibility. I'm going to stop you the there, Kofi. Thank you so much. The, Just to make sure we only have a few minutes left of the whole webinar. So I want to make sure we get time for everybody. But we'll come back to you for some last words to make sure we don't lose your points. Thank you so much for stressing the civil society engagement with women leaders, the capacity work, and the resourcing point, which I definitely want to come back to because it's been raised in our questions. Meanwhile, let's turn to you, Jose Vicente. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us about your experience, particularly on gender analysis and how you leverage that for change. Over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Good day, everyone. It's an honor for me to be with all of you in this important event. Warm greetings to all the audience and panelists, and my special thanks to all the UN agencies in our gender team group in Costa Rica. Let me start saying that this group is recognized as the most dynamic and empowered team in, within our UNCT. Under the leadership of the chair agency, all resident and non-resident agencies in Costa Rica 
actively participate in its working plan annually and have and conduct comprehensive reflections and analysis, but to address and to generate gender issues and promote effective gender equality. This has been a legacy among the UN agencies chairing the GTG, and it's something that we need to preserve. In Costa Rica, first it was UNESCO, then UNFPA, and now UNDP. Uh, our group has been key to provide support to the UNCT in gender equality and the empower of women in their diversity. And to this end, we have worked on conducting socioeconomic analysis of the COVID impacts and also what would be the best response, placing women at the center of a green, inclusive and sustainable recovery. Uh, we have also worked on strengthening the joint actions of our cooperation framework with, with our countries' development partners. And obviously, we have also generated the spaces for reflection and action to reduce gender inequalities by women in all agents and from an intersectional analysis. Uh, this has taken place trying to build an effective response with an intersectional gender perspective to address crisis situations. Um, our team has strongly advocated that the health and socioeconomic response to COVID have this intersectional gender perspective at addressing the differentiated impacts faced by women of all ages in their diversity. Uh, to this sense, we have developed a multidimensional response to address the gender-based violence exacerbated by the pandemic, reduce the economic impacts of COVID-19 and protect groups of women in situations of greater vulnerability and exclusion. We have also worked with the National Women's Institute to coordinate interagency efforts and also to conduct joint assessment of the gender differentiated impacts that the pandemics and other crises are affecting women in all their diversity. All these we have done in permanent coordination with the resident coordinator's office aiming at achieving the one UN vision. As UNDP, we would like to thank the RCO for giving us the opportunity to lead this group. This has provided unique opportunities for us to effectively play the UNDP's integrator role in linking the SDGs as per the UN reform. Effective gender equality has shown an integrating power for the efforts of the agencies to reach the goals of the 2030 agenda in an integrated manner. As mentioned to Costa Rica UNDP team, in case we would need to pick only SDG, one SDG to work, I would choose SDG 5 because of its integrated, transformative, and accelerating power for the Agenda 2030. I would also like to share uh, the personal experience, to share having a man as a chair of a UN gender theme has contributed to show how the need to fight gender inequalities and discriminatory social norms and promoting positive masculinities are tasks that require the full involvement, commitment, and action from men. This has not been exempted from some predicaments. I still remember this last November, when as the chair of the UN Gender Group, I addressed 60 angry women on occasion of the workshop within the 16 days of activism for eradicating violence against women. Our message, I mean the RC's message, Ms. Alegra Bayokis and my wife, crystal clear. Men need to transform themselves for effectively contribute to eliminate this kind of violence. And we are here, I need to be here in this day, which we were saying this day, to advocate for this very needed transformation. Obtaining the UNDP's gender goal seal, the highest corporate certification, has allowed to us showing that changing our culture is feasible, and we are very grateful to all those agencies interested in replicating this journal and this journey. Finally, I would like to highlight two challenges we face as an interagency group. Uh, maybe just very briefly, Jose Vicente, yeah. kindly. We Thank need you to so work much. closer with other interagency groups, ensuring, for example, that we will build an integrated response to address the climate and biodiversity crisis, having women at the center of the climate action and BD protection. 
We need to redouble our efforts in ensuring that the transformative gender culture is more deeply adopted in program and operations. We have an outstanding opportunity now that we are starting the new UN cooperation framework. And finally, we definitely need more men committed to effective gender equality in our gender team group in Costa Rica. Thank you so much, Lauren. It was a great pleasure to hear you, and I know that our participants have really felt inspired to know that there is a gender theme group that is the most dynamic and exciting in a UNCT. How fantastic. Um, I'm just, uh, we've had a chat, you know, literally exploding as everybody's been talking. A couple of questions around how have we engaged donors? Perhaps I can turn that to you, Ziad, in a second. Um, what's been your experience there? To any advice to other resident coordinators, Ulrika, if you're still online, I might be turning to you. And then maybe just uh, a last word from Kofi and Jose Vicente of how, what advice you would give others, um, particularly gender focal points and specialists in countries of how to incentivize me other members of agencies who might be reluctant to join or feel overburdened or say, we just don't have enough people. Um, so let me start with the resourcing question to use here. Thank you, Lauren, and, and thank you for the question. Um, there's, in my experience, both in Nepal and Jordan, there's been, you know, good opportunities for engaging with donors, uh, not specifically in terms of resourcing for the mechanism itself, uh, but in terms of strengthening or promoting a a more coordinated approach among the donors themselves towards national gender equality priorities. Uh, so, for example, here in Jordan, there's a senior level, ambassador level gender coordination group, uh, which we co-chair uh, with uh, the National Commission for Women, and which provides an entry point, a platform for, for us to advise based on evidence, data, et cetera, et cetera, with, of course, national priorities at the forefront, where some of that donor funding could be best targeted and who's doing what across the donor landscape to avoid you know, duplication, but also to promote uh, joint up efforts among donors uh, who have similar uh, gender equality priority issues in the country. And then very, very quickly in Nepal, a very, very different context, of course, po post earthquake, but again, a similar effort to do a couple of things, bring greater coordination and coherence across donors' decision-making in terms of uh, supporting Nepal in its response and recovery efforts, but also in terms of supporting directly uh, local national women's civil society organizations in terms of their positioning to demonstrate they had a very concrete uh, role to play in supporting the country in its recovery and response. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ziad. And actually, you've looped us back to an Anita's original argument about how gender theme groups can really play an influencing role across the UN system in terms of how we invest member state contributions, but also working with donors so that we influence their own coordination and investments as well as with government. So uh, the power of the collective yet again. Um, let me now turn to you, Ulrika, some advice to other RCs, perhaps yes, in a uh, sentence or two. <laughs> yes, uh, so I, I know that there are many uh, fellow, uh, both sister and brother RCs that are very keen supporters of the gender theme groups around the world. But uh, so I would say three things. One is it doesn't happen by itself, so you need to dedicate time. Uh, and particularly if you have a new team, if you arrive to the country or if you uh, or if you're just in that uh, sort of um, that rollout year where you start to prepare your CCA and then your CF. So dedicate time. Secondly, see it as uh, not only our responsibility because we are accountable at the end of the day, uh, also for some of these results, but also as an opportunity. Bring uh, the GTG members uh, with you when you talk to the gender machinery, uh, ministers, prime minister. So use it as a, as a really, conducive resource, be allies. And, and you can, as an RC, you can then help scale up those messages and those, but you could also build in, in your own discussions with, uh, with political leadership, but also uh, sort of other uh, governmental leaders. 
So the third one is obviously um, you need to know your team. So if there is someone out there who is a strong gender advocate, but not in the gender theme group, bring it into the gender theme group. So again, it's about scanning your environment. Um, and I guess with that also comes, you need to know, I thought it was a really good point on the, uh, on the, um, the women's uh, rights organizations and civil society organizations, you need to know them. You need to spend time out there. We do a listening exercise actually together with the UN Women and UNHCR, we, sit, we actually sit down with women, women from different communities, primarily minorities. Um, could be IDPs, could be other types of minority groups, uh, Roma, for example, and sit down and just listen to them uh, so that you understand the situation much better. Those would be the three uh, key uh, recommendations. Over. And I will have to actually leave right now, but uh, it was really inspiring and, and great to see so many dedicated colleagues. Thanks for organizing this. Well, thank you, Ulrike, for your substantive and also inspiring remarks, and it was great to have you. Thank you to those who are staying very kindly a few minutes over. We'll aim to end in two minutes exactly. Um, let me turn to you, Kofi, next. In a, in a sentence, what would you, your advice be to incentivize membership in the GTG as well as effective functioning? Uh, thank you. Uh, as I said uh, in my uh, presentation, I think uh, here in Madagascar, uh, at the level of the, of the RC, we don't have a problem. I think it's already converted. But I think what we need to do is to try and convert maybe the, the, the other head of agencies, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, we are all at the same, same level of uh, understanding. So it, it will require some sensitization, probably some trainings, I don't know. Uh, and I don't know whether DCO maybe may be able to have a training for reps, for example. So this is something that needs to be done because sometimes the focal points uh, are okay to uh, are fine to 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 to, to support uh, the work of the, the the GTG, but they might not have that particular time because they have been given some assignment. So we need to be able to uh, to bring the, the the head of agencies on board uh, so that uh, they apply some flexibility for uh, the. Uh, the focal points, you know, to be able to uh, devote some time to the work of uh, of the of the GTE, uh, and um, I, I, if you allow me, I, I want to say that you know the issue of uh, of gender is prevalent here in Madagascar, and I believe that uh, with the absence of uh, UN women, maybe UN women should consider, you know, uh, operating also in Madagascar, either remotely or physically because we have a lot to do here and uh, we believe that uh, we need to have all hands uh, on deck. So I think women that's a brilliant working. appeal and I know that the UN Women colleagues online will be delighted to hear how much their services are in demand. Thank you Kofi um, for reiterating that. Let me turn to you quickly Jose Vicente. Yeah first and foremost and particularly to the uh, male colleagues I would like to invite them to participate in the GTGs because this provides a unique opportunity to transform ourselves. On the other hand, uh, I think that it will also help to build or present strong evidence on the increasing development gains that provides to societies and economies, placing women at the center of the socio-economic recovery. And thirdly, uh, I would suggest to, to having your teams uh, during the uh, performance planning goals, a specific goal related to uh, advancing gender, effective gender equality. That would be my three uh, suggestions. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much for those very empowering last words. I know that everybody is getting off this call thinking uh, not only are gender theme groups critical, but actually can help to make the UNCT a stronger one and the investments of the UN in a country more targeted, more focused and particularly pertinent to these pressing gender equality crises that women and girls, men and boys face today. Um, I want to thank the fantastic panelists. I think we're all thinking the same thing, which is how can we work with all of you in the future um, to have such a 
bold and ambitious leadership agenda. I want to thank everybody who joined today for such a lively chat. Um, there's so much good practice and lessons learned being shared amongst peers in the chat to overcome challenges like no capacity, no funding, no time, no incentive. Um, so I do invite you to watch the recording, um, to download the standards and procedures. Thank you very much for putting that up on the slide and also um, learning from each other and to continue the conversation in your countries, across countries and beyond. It's been a great pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you very, very much to the organizers and it's been great to be online. Have a wonderful week.